we do we do um sorry i got a strange robotic voice there telling me zoom is recording so that's okay we're all being listened to so be careful what you say um yes so we, we're looking to to offer this kind of assistance and and we kind of sit in the space kind of between humanitarian organizations between the commercial and private sector and between the academic world um, and we look to see what are the best practices and lessons learned from those various um, groups who are focusing on supply chains, specifically humanitarian supply chains, um, and then share that actively um, with, with the organizations who are on the ground doing this type of humanitarian work and who have supply chains in their operations. So we were, we were set up a few years ago now, 2014, as a non-profit organization in, in Switzerland. And currently we have four regional offices around the world. We have one in Singapore. We have Amman in Jordan in the Middle East area. We have one in Nairobi, Kenya for the East Africa region. And we have one in Dakar and Senegal for the West Africa region. And as it says clearly there, our, what's our mission? Our mission is, our ambition is to be a catalyst for transferring supply chain and logistics knowledge that will improve the lives, opportunities, and potential of, of people and communities. And what does that mean in a nutshell? That means that myself and my colleagues are fortunate enough um, to be able to offer this, this assistance, which is pro bono, to humanitarians to help them improve their supply chains um, and their processes um, and look at the best ways of, of improving their work, ultimately for, for the beneficiaries that they are serving. Um, and I'm, I'm quite fortunate and, and glad to be working in this space. Um, I'm just going to try and move on the next slide here now, but we've got so many Zoom things, it's uh, going to be fun. Here we go. So a bit of background in terms of capacity building. Um, the graph you see on screen now um, on the left is looking at the good old gap between the funding requests um, in the humanitarian world and the actual um, funding that comes in from the various donors around the world. Um, and as we, we know, the people who work in this space, there is pretty much always a gap um, between the need um, and the actual what, what you're given. Um, so the graph there just shows that gap. Um, over time, it's, it's pretty um, consistent. Um, we never seem to have enough money for humanitarian operations um, uh, when, we, when there are emergencies. Um, and even development projects um, can struggle in, in terms of getting funding. So on the right there, it just says, you know, how do we how do we achieve more with less? Because we have to recognize there will be a gap. Um, and one of those ways that we're looking at today is, is the capacity building of the people who are actually doing the work, but also everyone else who's involved in the wider supply chains. Um, and as we will hear from, from DHL and we will hear from USAID and from Jonas on the academic side, you know, th this is the kind of, and this Helix Expo is one of those good events where it gets those different supply chain players together and to share their background and share the knowledge um, to increase that capacity of the people who are actually um, doing the day-to-day -day work. And, and as it also says there, um, and all of us who work in supply chain, we recognize that in a total budget for a humanitarian project, especially an emergency one, generally you're looking at about 60% to 80% of the total costs will go on humanitarian supply chain. The costs of the goods, the costs of the transport, the costs of the storage and the distribution and all the staff and everything around that is by, by, by far the biggest consumer of those funds in a humanitarian operations. So it makes complete sense to, to really focus on the capacity building and the preparedness work. Now, from my own background, very much operational humanitarian work, and I know how it can be difficult to convince management, to convince um, donors, to convince other people that investing in preparedness can really have big returns. And, and we'll see more about how we can start to show that um, and to, to really prove that that money up front, that work up front goes a long way then when, when the disaster comes. Um, but often, more often than not, there's a hesitancy with, with different people. In my own personal life, sometimes you think, oh, well, maybe it'll never happen or I'll deal with it when it happens. And then you look back and you think, oh, if only we had done a little bit more in preparation. So it's quite a human nature kind of thing to kind of put off um, some preparedness work. But as we see today, 
Um, we're really talking about large amounts of money that can be saved, better quality of service, um, and more time that can be saved. So on capacity strengthening itself, um, the future generation is key, of course, um, but we can start today. Um, all of us here are probably involved in one way or, or another with humanitarian work. Um, and whilst there's a saying of you can't teach an old dog new tricks, I think we, we can all realize that we can learn better ways of, of doing what we can do. Um, one of the things I've found in, in kind of my own personal situation, but also when, when looking to work with, with um, others in improving, is that often we can be hesitant to kind of people coming in from outside or someone telling us, hmm, I think you can do that a little bit better. Um, there's often a, a resistance. Um, and so a big part of our work is, is working openly and honestly with, with humanitarian agencies and saying, look, you know, you've been doing great work. We're all trying to do our best across the supply chain and across the, the, the humanitarian world. Um, but we all recognize we could do things better. Often we won't have the budget for training, perhaps, as, a, as, a, as an organization, or you may struggle to find the time for your, compared to your day-to-day -day work of the actual operations. Um, and it's what we try and do as well is we can, we can help show those recommendations um, to the higher management, to the wider organization, and kind of prove, look, here's where you can save money, here's where you can save time, and therefore your service will, will be improved for the beneficiary. And at the end of the day, that's all we're all trying to do here. So we look at capacity building through knowledge transfer, um, and we do that as well, not just with the humanitarian agencies, but with academic partners, and, and Jonas is going to talk a bit more about that. Um, and then for, for here in the Asia region specifically, with, because we're here at the, the Helix Expo, um, we can look to customize and, and localize trainings. And I think that's quite important. On one hand, we recognize, and, and all of us I'm sure do, that there are the basic concepts of, of efficient and effective, effective supply chains and how you can best run logistic services, warehouse services, um, procurement, contracting, et cetera. Um, but we also need to recognize that each country is different, each region is different, each organization is different, different cap capabilities. Um, and we're very um, keen to, to, to localize and make bespoke trainings based on the best practices. I think that's quite important that we recognize there's not one fits all for, for, for anybody. Um, and we need to have that kind of um, that variety and flexibility uh, when it comes to all of us learning new things. And also it's, it's taking, taking the best for, for you and your organization when it comes to new learning. Um, but it's getting you on that road that, that's important. Um, humanitarian partners need skilled and knowledgeable workforce. I mean, yes, it's, it's quite obvious and straightforward, but it needs to be from day one. Um, I know from my, my own personal history of, of starting out in the humanitarian world, um, I was picked up by a small kind of charity and, and sent off to, to East Africa. Um, I had very little background of, of kind of um, capabilities and skills at that time, but I had a very open mind and would just was willing to, to try and, and help where I could. You know, I look back now and think, gosh, that was probably a little bit reckless and, and how important it is to have more tra better trained, more informed um, and more skilled people to go into these jobs. And I think historically, um, you know, the logistics and supply chain um, kind of work that many humanitarian organizations have done in the past, a lot of it has been seen as kind of because it's to do with the physical stuff of moving things and transporting things. Again, from my experience, I think the wider organizations of our own organization sometimes don't understand the complexities um, of what it takes to actually build up a logistics person, um, but also they just kind of leave the, the logistics to make it happen, we wave our magic dust and we make it work. Um, and I think we see now, now that we're recognizing the, the massive amount of funding that goes into this part of an operation, the more supply chain is being recognized as, as the key often in emergencies um, in terms of the effectiveness and the quality and hence the need for capacity building, getting the right people trained up, giving the time to those staff um, to, to really learn the best practices and to then collaborate as wider groups um, and not have this mentality of it's us against them, they've got a different color t-shirt, we need to make sure our boxes are seen and our branding is seen. 
you know, because ultimately we're supposed to be there for the beneficiaries. So it's getting those staff and, and individuals ready from day one, um, because otherwise they're already going to be struggling um, in the long run. Um, and when it comes to collaboration, um, that's again something that we look to do and we encourage, um, like the Helix Expo, uh, we encourage uh, conferences, we've, we've uh, organized facilitated Africa Logistics Conference, which was a regular event until the pandemic has kind of slowed things down. Um, and we work closely, as I'm sure many of you do, with the Global Logistics Cluster. Um, again, if, if any of the participants don't have much knowledge of the Global Logistics Cluster, please look them up on, on the web. A great platform um, to include not just kind of um, uh, nonprofits, but also the private sector um, to really collaborate in terms of sharing knowledge um, and building the strength and capabilities of, of all of us who, who work in that system. Um, we also look um, at the active contribution to publications. I think we all have a lot more that we could learn from the academic world in terms of supply chains, the data behind it, the theory behind it, um, and bringing that into humanitarian supply chains. Um, so again, we, we look to, to implement uh, papers and, and submit to, to various reports. Um, and we do that also with um, collaboration with universities because as I said kind of earlier on, we, we feel that we can facilitate these different nuggets of information and specialisms and bring that forward um, to, to share and, uh, with the humanitarian agencies on the ground. And so, you know, when we talk to, I know when I used to talk to kind of senior management about investment and, and capacity building, um, there was always a kind of hesitancy, as I say. Um, I think over the last few years now, it's, it's been proven through many studies and reports of how, for example, as you see on the screen, you know, in basic one, $1 in preparation can save up to $7 during an actual response. Um, and that's quite a saving. So when you multiply that out um, to your costs after you look at your emergency response, um, that, can, that can run into the hundreds of thousands of, of dollars. So it's important to get this kind of um, information shared within one's own organization, um, but also within, you know, showing the donors and showing, um, you know, thinking about this when you're looking for your funding, if you're involved in that, of how you can show that you've thought about the planning, you've thought about the pros and cons, and how you want to invest in between disasters um, to make that savings, because that's money, obviously, that can be plowed back into a response or used elsewhere to make the whole response that, that much more efficient and, and effective. One example here, um, I'll just quickly run through for, for one of our own projects that we do with Help Logistics. Um, we were approached by the World Food Programme in Nepal um, to help them to work with um, looking at the different modalities of supply chains that were available to the National uh, Nepal Government School Meal Programme. Um, WFP we're looking to, to hand over to the government um, and obviously there's lots as we know in a supply chain there are lots of variables lots of options um, but which one is, is the best which one is the most effective and some effective and something we do is we work um, through field trips or through surveys interviews data ana analytics um, and we break down and spend the time looking at all the different types of options so in this example the different modalities should the government bulk buy rice at source? Um, should money just go straight to the schools and let the schools do individual um, school, uh, food procurement at the local level and everything in between? Um, because as we know, those kind of supply chain decisions are not easy when you have so many moving parts, so many stakeholders. Um, and that's something that we can offer to step in, do that research, be that extra pair of hands and eyes and ears um, and take the time to work out what might work best for different agencies. Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of, the, what we end up with there in this example is a, a wide ranging report that is then shared with the different stakeholders who can then determine the best recommendations uh, in moving forward. And then for us, we look to then share any lessons learned out of that kind of a project with the different um, humanitarian players, either through the logs cluster or through our own kind of um, reports. 
And just coming towards the end of the little presentation here, another thing we do on the capacity building, again, looking at individual training. Um, one of the things that we found uh, that we had to adapt to, obviously, like everyone else in the last year, is lack of face-to-face -face trainings. We have a number of different training um, modules and courses that, that we offer. Um, and so we've had to, to adapt and put, start putting our content online. And obviously, one of the benefits of, of doing the online training aspect is that individuals can potentially log on when it suits them and their timings. There's less of a stress on the individual participants in terms of all having to be together in one way, in, in one space at one time. Um, but what we also recognize is that face-to-face -face is important. And so, for example, we will, we will blend our content of our training courses now to include live Zoom sessions, um, to include uh, multimedia through the courses, online quizzes, um, and keep that interest um, going amongst participants. Because none of us, like, you don't want to listen to me for two hours or a whole day, God forbid, droning on about a subject, because no matter how interesting it is and how keen people are, um, we're just human. So it's important to keep the, keep the different um, aspects going to keep people included. And that's on screen is just a, a couple of examples of the kind of thing that, that we offer to try and help build up um, from the, the, the new entries of, of logisticians that might be entering a, a company or an organization, um, all the way through to some specific ones like our medical logistics and pandemics, which will also now include um, some cold chain information, which of course is very relevant. Um, and that's something else that, that we can offer to build on that capacity building, because ultimately, if you don't have knowledgeable people, I think, I think you're, you're really um, going to suffer. You can have the best processes, the best platforms of kind of communications and warehouse management systems and, and all kinds of things, but it's the people ultimately at the end of the day who have to run those processes. And it's the people who come up with the new ideas, the new ways of adapting um, to, to these kind of humanitarian emergencies. Um, and so it's important to, to give them the skills um, to do that and, and the space and that's what that's something we try and we try and ensure to do so just uh, finish up my key takeaways um, I think from our side we're seeing more of a demand to build capacity more of a recognition um, with donors for example on on the the benefit of, of actually putting some money into preparedness um, and and building up and we're going to hear more from from Jonas on on a particular kind of preparedness um, model and we'll also hear from um, Harlan in terms of the views from, from the donor side. Um, um, and the supply chain management is increasingly recognized as, as critical success factor. As I say, you, you can't really deny the numbers. You can't, you know, um, if it's 60 to 80% of your total budget, that's where the focus needs to be as an organization. Um, that's where you're gonna make big savings um, quite quickly by putting in the right training and the right, right processes and, and procedures. Um, so I think that that's me. That's kind of help logistics um, in a nutshell and give you a flavor of what we do in terms of capacity building. Um, what I'd like to do now is to offer to pass across to Jonas. Um, Jonas, if you don't mind, give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself and CORD um, and the academic kind of side of capacity building. Um, and uh, away you go. Thank you, Jason. And I'll stop sharing in a moment when I can find the stop share. <laughs> there we go. Okay, let me start sharing mine. Okay, can you see my screen? No. Okay. Yes, cool. thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, um, yeah, um, I'm very much pleased to, to be here. Um, uh, thank you, Jason, for, for having me. Um, um, a big thank you also to the AHA Center for organizing that, that event um, in, the, in this conference. Um, I think that the, the topic is uh, certainly an absolute important one. And um, um, I would actually like to focus in my presentation also on the capacity building, building a little bit on what Jason had said before, but then also bring this aspect of how do you measure the impact that you actually make through capacity building, be it training, so be it another preparedness activity, because I think this is still something very much missing, and that might also be one of the game changers in the in the future when we are going to be able to measure better um, um, what capacity building really means. Jason gave some examples of the one to seven ratio. 
there's certainly more than also just money saving. There's there's other elements as well to be to be measured, and that's what I'd like to um, focus my my um, talk in the next um, 10 to 15 minutes on. So um, I think Chase mentioned at the beginning that um, there was a change in the agenda. So um, I'm obviously I'm not Maria Bizu. So Professor Maria Bizu was supposed to speak to you this morning. Um, um, or this afternoon, she um, she lost her voice over the weekend, and the doctor told her to not speak at all in the next um, seven to ten days. So she was not um, able to to come. Ask me to to jump in. I'm very happy to to do so because I've been working with Maria on this research for the last five years. So I, I think or I hope I will actually be able to to um, um, present um, what she was initially um, um, intending to to say. So um, maybe a very brief introduction about um, the agenda. Um, so I present a little bit about the court center and I'm sure pretty much none of you have really heard of it because it's very new. Um, then I would like to take a deeper dive into the um, preparedness investment cycle end to end. So um, I mentioned before, it doesn't stop with the actual investment. We have to go much more into the actual impact measurement. Um, I would like to present an extensive study we have done on the supply chain costs, which have ultimately lot led to um, um, what um, Jason um, told you before on the one to seven ratio. Um, I want to present to you a dynamic model. So um, um, you don't have to be afraid, not going to go deep into any uh, academic um, 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 complex modeling, um, but still want to give you this example because um, I really think that the humanitarian supply chain um, is very complex and we need to have um, specific tools to, um, to analyze. And um, we find that um, a system dynamic model approach is actually giving you quite some of the answers which might be needed. And then ultimately, I would like to conclude with a framework that we have been developing and that we are currently testing. That might also be one of the practical takeaways um, for you to really start looking into how can I measure the impact of our work, especially when it comes to preparedness. So, what is CORD? Who is CORD? So CORD is the Center for Emotion Logistics and Regional Development, has just been established at the beginning of this year um, um, by the Kühn Logistics University and by Health Logistics that Jason has presented to you in, in detail before. Um, actually, the Kühn Logistics University and Health Logistics have been working together for many years, um, but over time, um, this relationship um, got closer and closer. We had more and more projects that we have been doing together and we realized if we bring together top class academic research education with operational training and consulting experience, excellence, which is coming from help side, um, we really have a unique offering in the sector. And um, um, this is actually something that we wanted to um, formalize, what we wanted to grow further. And that's when this um, center was established. Um, um, what we do is research, um, um, is education, and to a certain extent also some um, um, very much um, 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 applied work where we analyze supply chains um, um, from a um, um, very much system systematic and rigorous um, um, way and um, to ultimately strengthen the supply chain um, um, in the humanitarian context. Um, I give you some examples of projects that we're doing later. Um, um, Jason has mentioned some of the trainings already that we are doing together and that we have been offering. So um, I'm very happy to, to present this um, a new center to you, and I think this um, collaboration of more the practitioner side and academia is a very promising one. And I know that in your region, this is really something that is also growing. Um, um, actually, I myself, I've spent quite some time in the Asia region. Um, I'm working for health logistics, and um, we have been collaborating with uh, many universities in the region, such as the Tamasat Business School, also University of the Philippines. And I personally really found that there's so much potential, maybe even more potential than we really see. And uh, I hope that I can presenting you can present you with this concept, this idea, um, um, and yeah, show you some of the benefits that um, 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 academia can bring to the table if you if you team up with them. So um, um, yeah, the the, the 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 foundation of my presentation is very much um, based on um, um, I think what what Jason has mentioned before that there's a growing funding gap, um, and there's obviously. Um, new ways required to operate. And that applies both to humanitarian agencies, but obviously also a lot to, to governments as well um, um, and any other actor who is involved. So I think there's a consensus in the, in the sector in general um, um, that um, um, the, the, the old ways, traditional ways of, of delivering aid um, um, have to be changed. There needs to be new ways. Um, um, and um, I would like to um, um, yeah, give you a few examples how this actually could look like. Um, 
the investment and building of capacity in supply chain is considered as a powerful trigger to save costs, as Jason mentioned before, um, um, time as well as lives. So there's, I think, not really a doubt on this in theory. Um, um, however, um, and I indicated this before, um, there seems to be some lack in proof and fact-based evidence. What is actually the in impact of preparedness investments? And um, yeah, maybe Harlan can later on, on behalf of the of the um, from the perspective of a, of a donor, um, tell you a little bit more about how maybe more systematic um, 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 fact-based evidence could also change the donor view on um, um, giving funding, um, on actually investing um, um, more in preparedness and um, more into the supply chain. And we hope that we can actually contribute to this discussion by providing some first um, evidence on what preparedness can bring to the table. The good news, and that is again, something why I feel that academia can really play a big role here is because and Professor Bezu and Vasno um, in their latest paper in 2019, they're discussing about the world of opportunities which exist in research, when research is looking into the humanitarian supply chain, when they're looking into um, um, preparedness work. And that's exactly um, that led now to the, to the next few slides um, on, this, on this topic. I wanted to start with the view on the, on the investment, um, 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 preparedness investment um, activities as we see it. So we certainly see it as a cycle. Um, probably it's a bit more complex than just the cycle, but I wanted to actually get away from the very linear view of you preparing and then at some point you have an outcome. So um, um, the, the, the view that we are taking is that we would actually start with this um, um, fact-based evidence right from the beginning. So there's obviously a problem. There's an, an issue, be the funding gap, be the um, um, commodities being um, 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 deliver too late or in the in the in the poor quality in the wrong quantity so there can be many failures obviously in the supply chain so um what we have been doing is we um, took a deeper dive into the um, supply chain costs and um, um, analyzing where most of the money is actually going into and then based on this understanding of um, the actual problem we developed this model um, to simulate um, the the humanitarian supply chain in all its complexity um, and kind of like find out what ways could actually be um, um, most promising in bringing change to improve the supply chain performance overall. Then um, based on this, we started to develop investment plans um, um, with these findings, making investments ourselves. Now we get back to this um, a little bit, little bit later. Um, and then ultimately, and that's what I um, said several times now to also measure that impact, which was then go back to the um, um, initial understanding of the problem when you actually know better what investment activity will bring most benefit in a certain um, 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 field indication um, that would actually, of course, bring hopefully the, the change uh, into the sector. As mentioned before, Marie and I and, and many others have been working in, on this um, for quite some time. It's pretty much started um, in, in the preparation for the World Term Summit in 2016. Um, where a paper was um, um, published um, um, from the logistics cluster and a number of other organizations, as well as Green Logistics University. And in this paper, the, the, the trends and challenges, opportunities of the supply chain in the humanitarian context were very much discussed. Then based on this um, the paper, um, we looked into the actual supply chain expenditures. And that is something that also um, 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 Jason um, was pointing out, the majority of the cost is in the supply chain. And what we've done, we analyzed um, extensive supply chain costs for a number of organizations and also actually um, um, supported the 60 to 80 statement where we found that 73% um, of the supply chain expenditure that we analyzed are actually supply chain related. And based on this, we followed up on looking into how much money can actually be saved. And there is this famous statement, $1 can save seven. And we wanted to proof case whether this is really the, the case. So um, just a brief word on the supply chain expenditure study that we have carried out. Um, so we have looked into 23 different emergency operations from 25 to 2019, five different organizations uh, around the world um, and a total spend of 313 million Swiss francs. And um, based on our analysis, we found that 73% of those costs were actual supply chain related. And you can see quite some of these um, emergencies that we analyzed are also in your region as well. So we couldn't really identify a major difference, whether it's an emergency in the Americas, in Asia, or in Africa. Then um, there was pretty much a common sense in terms of how much money went into the supply chain. Then, based on this, we developed the system dynamics model. 
And um, what we did, and I don't want to show you the, 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 the full complexity of the model, but in, in, in very simple terms, we analyzed and mapped out the supply chain from the very beginning of the assessment, um, sourcing, procurement, transportation, um, as well as distribution. So that is very much what we looked into. Maybe one interesting aspect, and that fits very well into the current capacity building discussion of this session. Uh, we took a very close look into to what extent does the supply chain capacity of people involved in the supply chain play a role in the overall performance of the supply chain operation. So we took very much um, 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 a close look into this and then analyzed if you strengthen the HR supply chain capacity, what impact would you actually have? And talking about impact, um, um, so we didn't look only into the cost. Cost obviously was a, was a major indicator we looked into. We also looked into the lead time delivery. So that means we looked into how much time does it actually take to get 10% of the needed, needed items to the beneficiaries? So that's more or less the fast on the ground lead time, which is obviously relevant for many organizations. But we also looked into the 90% um, or full um, 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 delivery lead time to deliver everything that is needed. And then on top of that, and that's besides the, the cost and time metric that we looked into is the local social impact. So that is very much that the system that we have built measures more or less how much money is staying in the country and how much money is actually spent outside. So that was a critical um, element for quite some of the partners that we have um, um, run this model with. We also looked into different operational settings. Um, we looked into organizations with a very much centralized setting um, and where the global headquarter is very much running the so show, so to say. Um, so if there's emergency happening, they are sending the people in, they are procuring internationally. Um, and they are pretty much managing also the supply chain on the ground. Then we looked into operational settings with a more decentralized setting. Um, so this could be an organization that has no global headquarter at all, let's say. Um, so it would just be, let's say, a national NGO. Um, and we looked into settings that are more hybrid where you have a global headquarters as well as a national office. And we were comparing if you invest um, into these different settings um, and to what extent does the um, um, increased performance or the ultimate impact um, differ. And uh, that's quite interesting, as I find, because um, we all talk about localization, we all talk about strengthening capacities in the countries. And um, with our study, um, we really wanted to see, is it really worthwhile to invest into this localization agenda? Or is it maybe from an from a impact perspective, more worthwhile to invest into the traditional settings of many organizations out there? And I would like to give you the main findings um, um, now. The first is actually that we, we, we can see that supply chain costs are a significant component of the overall emergency response. So the 60-80 is certainly true. Um, um, so our um, studies are certainly supporting this statement. The second one when it comes to analyzing the impact of preparedness is that we found that preparedness pays off for all operations and across all of the metrics that we look into. So if you invest into your supply chain, you can really expect that there's gonna be savings in terms of cost, there's gonna be savings in terms of time, and there will also be a local social impact if you invest more in the countries, um, um, be it through strengthening of the local supplier, speed of strengthening the local staff, um, ultimately you will have your local social impact increase. And that's maybe one of the most interesting findings is that overall we found that the largest impact potential is in the decentralized, meaning the localized um, 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 setting. So if you invest heavily into a local setting, you can expect the most um, 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 impact. Um, and um, um, that should certainly be a reason to, to, to continue with the localization agenda. What we also found was that the holistic investment, so if you invest in different activities, and that's maybe also something to discuss later, trainings is certainly one element and it's an important one as Joyce Jason pointed out, but it's obviously also not the only one, um, but the same is very much true also for the, I think the most common pre um, um, preparedness activity, which is pre-positioning. So what our model also found, if you only do pre-positioning, obviously that doesn't really help um, um, or doesn't bring the best results neither. So it's important that you look into the different preparedness activities which are out there and then find the best combination and then also diversify then your investment accordingly. So um, one takeaway here is don't look only into one bead, only training speed, only pre-positioning, but look at your supply chain and see what is actually the most um, promising one across all with the um, um, overall impact on the supply chain performance. Then lastly, um, um, some very important factors to look into because obviously not every emergency is the same, not every country is the same. 
So um, um, some aspects to really look into, and I give one example as the capacity in the country. So obviously, if there is a country with um, um, a very poor um, capacity, um, um, let's take some countries in Africa like um, um, Somalia or South Sudan. Um, so our model shows here that the, the funding that I've mentioned before, that the decentralized setting is most promising, is not always true. So if there's really not really a lot of capacity available, um, then obviously you can't do too much in um, 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 investing into the country. But if you take countries that are um, more developed, that have actually um, stronger markets, and we look very much, for example, into the Philippines, there's enormous potential if you actually invest, invest in settings um, of, 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 of such countries. And um, that is, I think, really also something interesting to observe. Coming back to our multi-year journey, um, um, so pretty much where we are now, um, 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 with all these findings that we generated, we went to quite a number of donors um, in the EU and, and, and some others and presented these theoretical findings to them. And we were able to convince some of them to actually rechannel some more funding into um, and prepare these activities. And we ourselves, we are combining two investments at the moment. One is in the Philippines, the other one is Madagascar. Um, where half a million US dollars is invested into supply chain preparedness, very closely linked to um, what we found um, in our studies. And ultimately, our goal is that once these investments are made, and I think in the Philippines, we're already quite far, um, we would really like then also to actually measure the impact um, um, in a real operation. So that is something that we work very closely with Jason, um, but also with the IFRC in Kuala Lumpur and the Philippine Red Cross to really measure then ultimately the impact in one of the um, upcoming um, response operations um, in the country, how much have we really achieved through this investment? And we hope that if we really show it, then um, also in reality that we can convince even more donors to actually invest into the supply chain preparedness. I want to close with the um, measurement framework that we have developed and that we would like to um, 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 test out. Um, um, we actually have taken the preparedness framework from Yare et al who differentiates preparedness investments into intra-organization and inter-organizational, looking then into different subcategories and ultimately the actual investment activity, which could be a training, which could be a supply chain system, which could be a, um, 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 a market assessment, et cetera, et cetera. And we are actually matching this with a score framework where we're trying to really map the supply chain processes to an operation in detail so it reflects reality. And then we're connecting those um, where we're really looking into, if you invest into this activity, what is then the impact on the different supply chain processes in regards to the different metrics that you can define? Um, we look into costs, as mentioned before, we look into lead time, we look into the local social impact. And then I guess many of you are also more and more interested in the CO2 reaction or sustainability in general. So we're looking into those. And then hopefully um, by, by next year, we will have some results and actually can share those results um, with you as well. And I think. This is the end of my presentation. So um, I'm handing back to Jason. Um, if you have some further questions, feel free to reach out to myself, also to Maria anytime. Again, she's sending her regards and hopefully next time her voice is back and then she can speak herself, herself again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. Um, yes, if anyone has any questions, please do pop them in the chat um, and we'll address them after the, the speakers have done their presentations. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it just shows you that, I mean, we, we really do need the evidence and, and working with universities and the academic sector is, is highly important, I think. Again, using myself as an example, in, in the old days of, of doing emergency work on the ground, I think, you know, lots of enthusiasm by everyone working on there to fix the problem, address the emergency, get goods there, do whatever it takes. Um, but often there was a lack of then either recording the kind of the lessons learned and the good things and the bad things, and then using that information to build a picture so that in the future, you can really have some concrete evidence to see how we can actually do things better. Um, and I think by working with the academic sector, their, you know, their specialism is in this kind of you know, data anal analyst analytics um, on the kind of theory side, and really digging in and, and expanding on kind of how different people do different things and why are we doing it that way? And then presenting it back to us um, as we're doing now with, with CORD um, as a way to kind of justify why it's good to do the preparedness investment 
why it's important and saves time, money, improves quality um, for, for preparedness and, and capacity building. So, so that's incredibly important. So, so thank you, Jonas, for that. Um, just to uh, speak to Maddie Atri, uh, who is helping us from AHA in terms of the Zoom, I think the next speaker we were going to have was going to be Carl, um, if that's okay, um, rather than Harlan from USAID. Um, so I think, Carl, you were going to try and present from your side, and if you have any kind of technical problems, we can probably jump in and, and try and help you with your presentation. So if that's okay, um, we'll move across now to Carl, who's with uh, Deutsche Post DHL and who's had many years working alongside the humanitarian sector, um, especially in the get airports ready for disasters, and we're going to hear more about that. So over to you, Carl. Uh, you're still on mute, Carl. I think that's the phrase for 2020 and 2021. You're on mute. <laughs> Let me unmute myself. Here we go. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, no. Not yet. <clears throat> I'm glad it's not just me that gets the technical gremlins attacking just, on moments. I'm just pressing the button share screen but um, anything coming no uh just yourself um so if you wish uh we can try we can ask yeah, probably uh mariati then why don't okay. we okay okay i'll let me let me share the screen thank you can you see the screen now that is it indeed thank you you might want to put it on full full view Can you move the view and then full screen? That might be better. Yeah, yes. Hang on. Will, will that work? Yeah. Full screen mode. Yeah. Great. Makes it easier, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm going to look at things a little bit from a more like DHL being DHL, a hands on perspective, a hands on um, approach. And where this fits in actually came very well visible in the slides that uh, Jonas was, was sharing, uh, namely in the bottom line of slide six there in that pyramid, it's the international or the domestic supply, the domestic the, the transportation. And then that very critical, extremely critical last mile. And I'll come back to the criticality of the last mile. Uh, and this is purely from experience where we've been, right? Um, so yes, next slide. It's all about preparation, preparedness, and be that, be that local, be that national, or be that international. The airport of a given country, depending on the size of it, will all be the critical point of entry for any relief goods uh, that would need to be sent in, be that on a local basis, or be that in part from an international uh, organization, the likes of UN OCHA, WFP, uh, or other. Um, and what are these problems? What are the problems that are uh, by default faced uh, by these airports after a natural disaster? And trust me, we, we speak from experience when we, for example, deploy our disaster response team. Um, there's four of them um, that we need to look into when, when an, as a particular airport could, could be assigned as a consolidation airport, a relief airport for the distribution in leg three and, uh, and delivery to uh, the recipients who need them. Number one, that would be ATC, air traffic control, right? Air operations. All of a sudden, um, when a disaster strikes, the airport gets flooded. Flooded by what? by goods coming in, be, that, be they solicited or be uh, flights um, just leaving and, and then asking for permission to land when they get there, particularly in the Nepal case that was. Um, so uh, people want to get out, people want to come in, SARS come in, USARS come in, other help comes in, again, local or national. Um, if the size of the country permits it, they will be flying in and not driving in, right? So that creates already a, a congestion in terms of passengers. And then at that airport, you will need additional facilities. 
you will need to check whether the electricity provision is adequate enough for all the enhanced activities. You would need to, to look at security. Relief goods come, come in. If you have a simple example, um, you need to make, do need to make sure that number one, whatever comes in and is being stored and staged remains safe from looting. You need to make sure that everything that is material handling equipment ranging from forklifts to tugs to tow have adequate fuel supply. You need to make sure that there is ample mobile communication, be that landline uh, or be that uh, uh, internet or, or mobile uh, phones. And of course, with the influx of, of a lot of people and a lot of help, you need water and you need sanitation provisions. So um, this is the, the common problems that airports face when they are or if they are selected uh, to be the consolidation airport. Next slide, please. So what it is, is uh, it's a public-private partnership that we have with uh, the United Nations Development Program. Um, it's, it's, it's been jointly developed and it helps the airport that is in either in a high risk area or that is chosen to be the relief airport because one of the other airports might be incapacitated as a result of that national disaster. Uh, it helps uh, the airports to prepare their staff, but also to prepare whatever facilities, whatever logistics they have to make sure that they are prepared for that. Uh, and when I say prepared for that, it needs to be prepared for the worst case scenarios. And at this point in time, very quickly, we've done over 50 airports around the world. And we've had about 1300 participants who took uh, part in that training with a, a good mix that will be shown in the next couple of slides. Yes, please. Um, so the concept is um, a sustainable and a participative approach. And what does that mean? We do not put the program or we do not put the assessment together. That is done by the participants. We are there, as you can see in the third, uh, at the far right there. DPGL is the trainer, DPDHL is the consultant. And we do this completely free of charge. The only problem, the only thing here is, not the problem, but the advantage is we do not do it with volunteers that are untrained. This is done by really by aviation and airport specialists. Um, uh, it, it, you know, we, we provide that logistics and that disaster management experience. Uh, and we have developed together with the UNDP that methodology and the training material. So you see the three, uh, the links there in the middle, you have DPDHL, uh, the group, the UNDP and the guard country, the guard country itself, and that uh, forms part of the guard training. So DPDHL, they are the trainers. UNDP, they are the facilitators. Uh, they will be engaging the respective or the relevant airport authorities. They will coordinate with the government agencies and they will moderate uh, the coordination calls uh, that involves the co-owners and the partners in the program. But overall, and last but not least, and very importantly, it's the airport authority or the civil aviation, if you wish, who are the owner. They make sure that whatever is found and whatever is put into the assessment program, that it is integrated with the National Disaster Risk Reduction Plan. And the updates, of course, have to follow. It doesn't make any sense after the workshop to shelf it. And then uh, all of a sudden, when something happens, to try and find out where the hell is it? And is it still adequate? So those are the prerequisites for us to say, OK, if those two prerequisites are met, then we will do this guard training. We will put our efforts and our people in there uh, to make sure that it is a success. Yes, next slide. Um, so how does it support that local capacity building? Now, before I go on, what you are seeing here was before COVID. So at the end, we will see how we do it now in COVID, in COVID times. So what we do is we put, we help the authorities put together a structured report, a very structured report about the airport's surge capacity. Um, an action plan with very time specific actions 
will be put together, actions that can be put into practice that are, if you look at this, we have this, this, this graph that shows uh, high cost, low cost, and then immediately possible and longer term. And anything that falls in that block lower cost and easily doable, that is what we would put together in that, uh, in that uh, plan, in that practice, in that action plan uh, that can be done within one particular year or one, one year after the, uh, after the workshop. So number three is that indeed it is local people, local staff from in and around the airport, from in and around the aviation authorities who are trained to effectively manage that response, that humanitarian response at the airport uh, when that airport is chosen. By no means is it an audit. All the results uh, that are found, all the action plans that are put together remain with the airport, even you know, from a, from, a, from a security perspective. If pictures are taken and uh, we are taking those pictures, those are handed over to whoever is in charge of that and then afterwards deleted uh, from any of our uh, records. Um, so all the results remain with the airport and ensures the best uh, improvement measures. But again, they need to be followed up. Next one, please. Um, in order to make sure that everything functions very efficiently and effectively, we usually target around give or take one, <laughs> uh, 16 recommended participants per workshop. Yeah. Yes, next slide, please. That, that actually gives you all also uh, a chance for all those stakeholders, those 16 stakeholders, if they do not know each other already, then there's a certainly an, an opportunity, the best opportunity to connect. So that already facilitates communication in case. Um, what we also need is fully engaged participant. It doesn't make sense that you go and sit there and then you go on your cell phone and you go on your laptop and once in a while uh, you pay attention. We do not allow that. Let me be very, very clear. Uh, that's another, that's probably the third prerequisite that we have. You pay full attention. We collect uh, data during the assessment and then we help the participants write the assessment report and the action plan. Um, and then uh, a number of, 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 of alternatives uh, are being developed, if not suggested, uh, to increase the capacity of the airport in the event of a natural disaster. What does that mean? Well, in, an, in a variety of airports, very quickly, in a variety of airports, uh, there is probably only one tug. There is maybe no forklift at all. They don't have any pallet jacks or too few. So we look at that and we say, we help them look at what do you have today? What will you need tomorrow when something happens? How do you fill that gap? And where can you get it? And when I say, where can you get it? That would comprise a list with phone numbers, addresses, and details of what particular vendors or people who can rent it out, where to get it at a very short notice. Next, please. So we split them up in four groups based on the, the mix of expertise that they have. It would be a full assessment of the airport operations. It will be a full assessment of the cargo terminal and what is available in terms of space, in terms of material handling equipment, handling equipment and so on and so forth. We look at the passenger terminal. What is the regular flow of in and out coming, in and out going passengers uh, in a normal situation? And how many would you be able to accommodate in and out in a disaster environment and what is needed to be able to do that? And then the fourth, but less, certainly not least, uh, facilities, which can go from fuel farm, from electricity provision, uh, internet connections, you name it. Um, all that is, is looked at with a very eagle eye. Next, please. Now, with COVID, the physical thing is limited. We can't fly in anymore. The trainers can't fly in anymore. And the trainers, unfortunately, uh, are based uh, here, me, in Singapore, and uh, the two others in uh, the UK. 
So what we've done is we've, we, and, and Cheryl was instrumental in that, and she's, uh, she's also here on, 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 on the uh, uh, workshop. Um, we've developed a hybrid guard that combines that virtual component uh, by, uh, uh, conducted by, by the aviation experts, uh, while we have, or we try and have a, a set of local trainers who engage with the participants in person. Again, provided that also domestic travel is not prohibitive or, or restricted. So the theory is done virtually on Zoom or Skype, whatever is, or Teams, whatever, whatever is available in the country uh, where the workshop is being held. Um, and we connect ourselves, the trainers connect themselves online. And when it comes to the physical part, we do the either WhatsApp video calls, and we have now introduced a pilot use of what we call augmented reality uh, uh, or augmented reality glasses. And you see the example here, one of our colleagues who is guiding uh, the participants and, and of course the uh, trainers uh, across the airport. Um, having said that, having done that, rest assured that security and safety is never lost out of sight. This is a sensitive area, so all precautions uh, and measures are taken to prevent anything from leaking. Next, please. After that, um, it is the report writing. Again, partly visual or partly hybrid and partly uh, uh, physical with the one trainer, as you see there in the left, uh, the left bottom corner is the, the local trainer who is assisting the participants in putting the assessment report together. And then again, virtually and in class 50-50, they will present uh, to the overseas experts and to the airport management, to the airport uh, owners, the owners of the airport uh, or the owners of the guard program, what they have found, what is being, uh, what can be done um, in a shorter term, say one year, to improve that capacity uh, preparedness and, and, and capacity search uh, program. Yes, please, next. So uh, very quickly, what does it do? It analyzes the airport's readiness today and what will be needed tomorrow. Three main blocks. It's the inflow of the four blocks that you saw, inflow of passengers, inflow of cargo, inflow of people, and increase in, in, in capacity uh, of the facilities, right? What needs to be done? What are the activities today? What will they, will, what will they be tomorrow? And what needs to be done there? And then the outflow, what do you have today? The same scenario, what will you have tomorrow? And what will need to be done uh, to keep that under control and make sure that the main target is keep the airport open, but also keep the goods moving from the airport to the last mile. And that's where sometimes it's very critical. Uh, and I'll come back to that later uh, at the closing. So create a greater ability to handle a sudden increase in aircraft, in people, and in cargo in combination with how do you then adjust your facilities? Yes, please, next. So as I said, we have done more than 50 airports uh, assessed throughout the world. You see them there on the map very quickly. And uh, in, in relation to that, um, with that knowledge also, we've done over 50 disaster response deployments to over 20 countries ever since its inception back in 2006. Well, 2004 to 2006, it was introduced in Asia Pacific. Um, and before concluding on the last slide, thank you. So what is usually missing at airports that we've done, and trust me, at every airport, we've had the same issue, not enough material handling equipment. Equipment is essential and critical. It doesn't, it, it's not enough to fly or to be able to fly it to the point where it needs to be consolidated or deconsolidated, offloaded, and then handed over to either road transportation or to the military to fly it into uh, non-accessible areas uh, or smaller airports. 
if you don't have that material. And that's what, that is what makes your chain as strong as your weakest link. And we've seen that throughout the many deployments that we've done, where we have a consistent and chronical lack of that particular material handling equipment that is so badly needed. And it can be from human resources, like I said, to the material, to the forklifts, to the pallet jacks, to the wooden pallets, because the airlines take their pallets back. They're not the same pallets. So equipment and material is quintessentially critical when you want to prepare an airport um, for a natural disaster when everything comes flying in. And that is the main, uh, the main objective of this uh, GART program, and that is uh, what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carl. Um, now, that's a really, really good example of, of capacity building kind of at the sharp edge, as it were. Um, we've all seen the, the large emergency response operations and the media love kind of getting to airports and, and watching goods being unloaded. Yeah. Um, that's what's get, what gets the highlights. But uh, as you say, it's building the capacity of those airports, certainly ones that maybe have frequent um, uh, natural disasters, whether it be flooding or a cyclone region. Um, and in between those disasters, it's so important to, to build that capacity and do that preparedness. And I certainly agree with you in your last point there about the, the, the weakest link in the chain. Um, yes, you know, I've, I've also seen that if you don't have that handling equipment, then it doesn't matter how many blankets and tents you, you deliver on a large aircraft, if you can't get them off, um, or if it delays and creates a bottleneck, um, then the whole operation is, is in jeopardy. Yeah. Um, and again, that, that's, that's also thinking about capacity building, as you say, about how can we have enough uh, handling equipment either available, but not just that, it's also then you need the staff to obviously drive the vehicles, use the lifts, um, they need particular licenses, training, there's insurance uh, implications, um, there's regulations at the airport and, and letting access to people on their on their runway, you know, all this needed things. Um, so I'm sure in your in your workshops and stuff, it's important to, as you do to, to really get that message about, about what are the processes, the standard operating procedures, the agreements we can have between the stakeholders before we actually have to run around and, and, and try and jump in a forklift and having that capability of the people as much as the, the actual equipment. And it's all linked, very much linked together in, in the whole capacity building picture. So thank, thank you very much for that. Um, so we'll, we'll move on now, if we can, to, to Harlan, um, who is representing USAID um, in, based in Indonesia at the moment. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to kind of Harlan's kind of perspective from a donor perspective um, and what they feel kind of um, is important in terms of capacity building and, 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 the, and the people and the training and, and, and from, from his perspective. Um, so Harlan, um, if you're okay, I think um, we've got uh, Madhuriatri has kind yep. of put your uh, presentation on board. So I'll hand across to you. Thank you. And apologies, Harlan. Um, I'm noticing the time and unfortunately yeah. when, when you go at the end, which I thought was the most important to get a, a good <laughs> regional perspective, you often are told that you don't have too much time. So apologies nope. for that. No, don't please, worry, I'll, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Please, um, please go ahead and, and, and uh, yeah, I'm sure if we run over, it won't be a problem. Um, all right, uh, uh, thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'd like to thank um, ASEAN and the AHA Center for, for organizing this event. Um, I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I actually came into the humanitarian world from the logistics world, uh, as opposed to being a humanitarian and then realizing logistics was important. Um, I was discovered the importance of transportation and logistics when I was Peace Corps volunteer in then Zaire, currently the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because you know we didn't have any. And that's when I noticed the importance of it. Um, they, they say the best compliment uh, a logistician uh, 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 can have is if nobody notices what they do. Um, that speaks to the earlier comment about trying to get attention uh, in the organization. Uh, if it's working, nobody notices it. They only notice it when it's not working. Um, so following my experience with, uh, with my, and my interest in transportation and logistics and seeing the importance that it had in 
um, in all society and all economy and in, in especially in developing a country as big as uh, the DRC and what the lack of that meant. I went to university in the US and studied uh, in an MBA program, transportation and logistics management. Um, it was taught you know, from the commercial side um, and it was, it was uh, basically it was an MBA program with a focus on transportation and logistics management. Now, at that time, there were very few programs like that in the United States. Today, um, there are plenty around the world as we do realize the, the supply chain, the importance of supply chain management. And it is in fact, both an art and a science. Um, so the, the growth of university programs, specifically in, in supply chain management, logistics, um, as well as in humanitarian and emergency management, um, is, is a real positive thing and it provides that theoretical base that's necessary. Now, it, I thought it was interesting that uh, was mentioned that, you know, that between 60 and 80% of the cost of delivering aid is delivering aid. Uh, um, in the commercial world in the US, I was told, you know, basically at that time when I was in school, about 30% of the cost of the product that you buy on the shelf and what you're paying for, about 30% of that is the logistics, is getting that product manufactured and delivered to the shelf where you can buy it. Now, we look at the humanitarian world is the, the high cost is some of that, you know, why is it almost double? Um, it could be that we're more inefficient. <laughs> it could also be that we have to do things faster, that the cost of a lost sale in business is, you know, a customer and a product you didn't sell, you know, to somebody. In our, in the humanitarian and emergency and disaster relief world, the cost of a lost sale may be a dead person. So while cost is a factor, cost is sometimes not our primary factor. Our primary factor is providing the life-saving relief after a disaster that people need. So there's a balance there and there's a trade-off like in everything. And as was mentioned, there never will be enough resources to make it happen. So anyway, that's my perspective. I, I left university and then I went to work for a humanitarian organization doing uh, logistics and with food aid programs and then conflict and natural disaster programs. I began to work with other people um, and realizing that logistics is not the is not usually the end goal of the program, but it is a way for the program to achieve its goals. It's a support function. So, and I thought it was a very good entryway into humanitarian assistance because I learned about um, a wide variety of things from supporting health programs, supporting and supporting all sorts of other types of things. So. Um, so I, I believe logistics is a really, it's an essential function and it is a good entryway and a good skill to have if one is going to go into disaster management and humanitarian assistance. Now, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, in the words of supply and demand, um, the supply of disasters <laughs> is expected to go up. Uh, the supply of events that will require emergency response, disaster response, or humanitarian assistance. And basically in the Indo-Pacific region, we see three kind of interlocking uh, drivers of risk. One is environmental degradation and natural resource depletion. That again is uh, upstream deforestation, overfishing, things that may have, have begun to make livelihoods um, you know, among, amongst a lot of people, uh, difficult to pursue. Um, also exacerbates, you know, flooding, uh, erosion, landslides, and other sorts of things that may occur. The second driver is that rapid and unplanned or uncontrolled urbanization. We have a lot of cities that are growing quite quickly, especially as rural people who cannot make a living in the rural area anymore because of the first factor move into cities um, and move into areas that are probably at high risk or unserviced, unplanned um, and, and prone to disaster events. And throw on top of that, of course, the one we're all familiar with and know and talking a lot about, which is climate change and extreme weather events. So 
if you look in the Asia Pacific region, very large cities located on the coast, sea level rise, more extreme storms. So basically the supply of disasters <laughs> is, uh, is only expected to go up. Now, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking, um, referencing articles uh, from this Journal of Emergency Management. Uh, I just wanted to, made, wanted to make sure that I gave them the um, attribution. Um, and it's uh, wonderful that there are academic publications like this. This particular uh, volume was a two, uh, a two volume series uh, and specifically about higher education and emergency management in the US. I'll be drawing off of some of these, these, these three specific articles that were in, in volume one. Uh, next slide, please. As I said, the supply of disasters is, is increasing. There's also the, so what about the demand for disaster managers? Is that the same? Um, the first article in the, of the ones I referenced, uh, uh, William Wong points out that, you know, internationally education is the fastest growing industry and education, um, you know, it's what's, is one of the building blocks for professionalization and that Emergency management, disaster management is, is, is actually one of the seen as one of the top 20 fastest growing career professions in the world. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is sort of the and what we're interested in is the professionalization of disaster risk managers and emergency management, humanitarian assistance. And part of that professionalization, you know, comes with taking advantage of uh, academic and higher education, not just for research, but really for the education, for the training and for the other things. But we really want to move into a, a field where it's, it's not just a kind heart and deep pockets that make a humanitarian, you know, uh, worker or, or a disaster manager. You need a bit more than that. And it's actually a profession, just like any other uh, skilled profession. And there are some things that that you know, and you know, in the old days, you know, you learned a profession as an apprentice from a master. You worked your way up to a journeyman. Eventually, you were a master, and you trained other apprentices. That's the old, old sort of skill guild system. Well, we had sort of maybe a little bit of system like that today that uh, that needs to come into play to to get ourselves much more professional, and to look at the professionalization. Let's start first with looking at, and a lot of people have begun to look at, you know, core competencies. What is it that you need to have to be a professional uh, emergency manager or disaster manager? Uh, next slide, please. Um, for the next generation emergency manager, um, this graphic shows sort of three expanding levels of, uh, of core capacities. It's a little hard to read, so if you go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to show that they're sort of nested in each other. Next slide, please. Yeah, these three levels of core capacities, that, that, inner, that inner ring, those are the ones that build you. So what do you need as core competencies, you know, as an emergency manager? You need to understand and operate within that emergency management framework. You need to have some critical thinking skills. Uh, because it is a dynamic environment. You need to have a sense of, uh, of professional ethics. I mean, you are dealing with people's lives and it's most important at the individual level, you have to have a desire for continual learning. This is not something that you learn once and then you know it and you've got it for the rest of your life. We're in a very dynamic and changing environment. So that, those are the kind of core competencies that an individual needs to have you know, that can build their place. Now you, you move up a level to building yourself as a, uh, you know, to build that practitioner. You've got to have a certain amount of understanding of the scientific aspects of emergencies and disasters, how storms are formed, how earthquakes happen, you know, what's, what, what's that about? When is a drought a drought? These sorts of things. You've got to understand geographic, socio-cultural, um, you know, aspects of the context of the community you're working in technological uh, innovations, GIS and all sorts of other new whiz bang tools. You've got to have at least an understanding of how to use some of the technology that's going to be 
be being introduced uh, to make your job better, to collect data, to transmit it. Um, and you need to have an understanding of systems. Really like, like supply chain management and logistics is a system. The whole of emergency management is a system. And you need to have really a, an ability to view things, not just from your, your little perspective or your piece of it, but how it fits into a bigger system. Now, it's very difficult for any one person to be a, a deep expert in all of those things, uh, but you need to have a familiarity, and that's the importance of working with a team. So usually nobody is a lone person out there by themselves. You work with a team in emergency management. And so in your team, there should be somebody that has maybe a greater specialty on the tech side, somebody else that has a greater understanding of the scientific and you can help each other out, but all of you have to have just a little bit of that. And then at the third level, yeah, an understanding of what is disaster risk management, community engagement, collaborative governance. As I said, nobody does this alone and it's not just the emergency management um, you know, operation that goes in and does it in a vacuum. You work with local government, you work with the affected community, you work with other players in government, you know, other interagency, private sector, NGOs. So you've got to have an ability to, to knit together and build and foster relationships because that really, it, it, it is a team effort. And, and generally, as I said, that's one way that you get, you get through this imbalance between resources and need is you, you work together and you combine you know, the best of agencies. And you, you don't sub-optimize and undercut each other and, you know, and waste time and resources. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, you know, other articles uh, and other research have pointed out similar competencies and skills, and, and here's a, a list of them. Um, you know, again, they mirror more or less what was, what was in there. Some things that pop out of, of continuing communication skills, networking skills, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, um, you know, and that, that one in the middle, the, the old management piece, that's also really important, very pedestrian, but it's planning, budgeting, personnel, delegation and supervision, running an operation. Empathy pops up a number of times as a, as a clear sort of competency that emergency managers have to have. You have to, you have, to have a certain amount of empathy that keeps you going because you, you say to yourself, what if that was me? You know, what if my house washed away? What if I was displaced with my family and kids? What would I need? Who would I need to help me? You know, and you hope that if that is you one day, that there's somebody like you on the other end to provide help. Um, next slide, please. Now in training and building up emergency managers, you know, again, a lot, of, a lot of training, a lot of education, a lot of time and effort, but we also need to have emergency managers that are resilient because a, there's a high burnout factor in a lot of professions. It's called helping, helping, person, helping people syndrome. A lot of medical workers, and we're seeing stories this year of these past sort of 18 months with COVID, you know, of nurses and doctors just basically some of them just giving up and, and, and leaving the profession altogether. They just got worn out. Um, you know, it was just too much day in, day after, especially in a situation where, you know, you, you seem to see more people that you can't help than ones that you did. Um, so how do, you, how do you maintain a certain amount of resilience? And so there's been some look at characteristics of, um, you know, what makes a resilient emergency manager, somebody that you can, can be, you can train, you can know, you can get better and you can stay in the business and get better and better without burning out. Next slide, please. Again, characteristics mentioned here, adaptable. Again, the situations change a lot. So you, you have to be able to, to, to change. Agile, making quick, criti you know, critical decisions quickly, often without, a lot of, without all the information you'd want. You gotta be able to work with each other. Resourceful is getting what you need, getting what's needed. That could be getting money, getting people, getting material, you know, getting equipment. Um, you've got to know what you need and you've got to be resourceful and know how to go find it. Scalable, again, being able to organize and, 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 uh, and handle a very, not be 
buffaloed by a huge operation, like the, in, the Indian Ocean tsunami was enormous. Um, I worked in, the, in Goma in Eastern Zaire during the Rwanda genocide. A million people crossed the border in, you know, in the space of 24 hours or so. It was huge, you know, but we just had to take, step, take a step back and say, it's the same thing, only just bigger. Let's break it into its pieces and figure out how to manage it. Um, again, you've got to be, you have to have a certain amount of physical and mental strength, probably more mental in many cases to keep going because, you know, this isn't, a, it's not going to be a, an eight hour a day, five day a week job. You know, when you need to, you're going to have to be pulling, you know, 16 hour days. Um, and, but that's only when you need to, because you've got to be, there's got to be a certain amount of redundancy as well. You've got to know when you need backups and replacements because nobody can work at, you know, at, at 100% capacity for very long. So otherwise you'll crash and burn. But the, the, to understand, you know, looking at uh, people's professional development, what are core competencies, and then, you know, if you've got the if you've got the uh, the, the wherewithal and the makeup to want to be an emergency manager, or disaster manager. You know, recognize that some of these things are innate. Some of them are part of you, you know, and, and your character. And some of some of them you can learn and be taught. But you got to have kind of those basics, you know, to begin with. Again, that empathy. It's really hard for somebody to teach you to be empathetic if you're not naturally so. Uh, that empathy is important. That 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 kindness and caring. Uh, that sort of critical thinking and uh, and agility. Also, something that you may have learned, but uh, it, again, it's it's not necessarily a, a characteristic that a lot of people can can take in. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in the United States, um, we worked a lot. Have FEMA has invested a lot in creating and building capacity of emergency managers and disaster managers in the United States. FEMA is our federal emergency management agency. It's the NDMO of the United States. And years back, they began providing funding, grants, making investments in universities, in academia, to do research, you know, to develop education programs, training programs, and create degree programs. You know, as the original slide on, on career and supply said, you know, the one earlier, they're just, they're really at this point, even in the United States, there are not enough PhD and, uh, you know, people with master's and bachelor's degrees in emergency management to meet the demands they're expecting in the US. So FEMA invested greatly in, in universities. And if you look to the website there, you'll find out more about what FEMA does with universities in the United States. And that strong public, uh, certainly national government, public sector, um, partnership and drive and funding and commitment is, is what's, what's made the United States, uh, I think, uh, pretty far along in this field of, of, of training uh, professionalized and professionalizing emergency managers. Now, we got a bit of a bump and a boost after 9-11, the uh, terrorist attack, when the government as well looked and said, oh, you know, there's the natural disasters, but we also need to look at what about the non-natural terrorism, things like that, unfortunately. That was a, a, a bit of a boon, at least to the disaster management community because reminded that those same skills in managing a, a rapid onset event, it could be a, a, you know, it could be an earthquake or it could be a bomb explosion. Those same skills, you know, need to be developed and maybe need to be developed more. Uh, the specific National Domestic Preparedness Consortium is a group of five or six American universities that, that really focus a lot on, uh, on the all hazards emergency management, but they, they, they look at a lot of like toxic, the, you know, the non-natural stuff. So has, hazmat and some counterterrorism type, types of things as well. But also it's a, it's a subgroup of those uh, universities. Now here in the Asia region, you know, there are a number of universities that focus on um, logistics, as, with, as has been mentioned. There are also a number of universities that focus in general on disaster management, or there, I, won't, I won't necessarily say a number of universities, there are a number of academics. I haven't really come across yet an, an actual degree program in disaster management or humanitarian assistance 
but I have come across a lot of committed professors. It's their area of research and their passion. It just hasn't yet translated into that actual academic or diploma or some kind of formal recognition of a degree program. Um, we are working with a number of, uh, have worked with a number of universities here in Indonesia. The Indonesian University Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction, you know, has done a lot of work. We've done a lot of work with them. Um, at the ASEAN level, we, we supported some initial research to create the, uh, to develop the ASCEND program, which is a, um, a program designed at sort of professionalization and credentialing disaster managers uh, at var in various skill disciplines, logistics being one of those. Um, again, it's a new nascent program, uh, but, but one recognizing that this is an area where we need some professionalization and standardization. So we, again, we work both in, in the US and internationally. You know, in the past, we've done a lot of training. Uh, then we've also done training, you know, sort of training with an idea of training of trainers. One of the big areas where the US has been focusing on in the region um, has been an incident command system, which is basically an, it's an ad hoc management structure, organizational structure for an ad hoc organization, meaning the organization of all the people that have to come together to respond to a disaster. Uh, and so it provides a common framework. And in that we've done a lot of training and we've also done a lot of training of trainers and seen in countries, especially the Philippines, Thailand, where it's really taken off and the, the Philippines where they use and continue to train and train others, you know, continuously. So we have these investments in, in training and capacity building. Um, I think we would like to really shift a lot of that to really focus on you know, some professional, really professionalization and getting it, getting it up to, uh, up to the right level. Uh, final slide, please. So again, how do we look to the future uh, and how do we meet those challenges of increasing exposure and risk and the need for people? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to attract the right candidates. You know, if you're going to do training, education, and capacity building, you've got to get the right people in there. Otherwise, you know, you'll be wasting your time with some of them. Then we've got to provide the right educational foundation. That theory is important. You know, the education, the theory, uh, you know, because that allows you to apply that theory. That theory can be applied in different circumstances. Um, so you need to have a, the a little bit of a theoretical foundation and the educational foundation. Then once you're hired, you need the right mentors. I mean, when I started working in the business, I mean, I, there were guys that were much more experienced than me that took me under their wing. I learned from them um, and, you know, and I hope to do the same for other people. Uh, but I think that that tradesman mentorship is a really important piece. It's not just the formal sort of training, but the, the, the mentoring opportunities an organization can provide or cross organization. Then you need the right opportunities to practice. So people coming out, they need to be able to go out on a team, work with people that are, you know, more experienced than they are, operate, get their hands dirty. They need opportunities as well in the education realm under types of simulations, training, and, and things like that to practice their skills where, you know, where lives aren't at stake, you know, especially at the beginning. So the role of these kind of simulations and, and stuff that's something that's really growing and needs to be applied to emergency management and, and certainly emergency logistics is right for that kind of, of practical training and, and capacity building. And then finally, and, and last, you need to develop the right incentives to encourage continuous growth and learning. As I said, you know, this is something that the, we, we work in a dynamic and changing environment and Disaster managers need to be fresh. They need to grow. They need to learn. They need to go back and refresh themselves. It's not something that you, uh, you know, you just when you think you've seen it all, the next one's got something different. So you've got to have that that incentive, you know, to be able to constantly access training, access opportunities to grow and to learn. And then you have to repeat that because, you know, by the time you get a, a well trained you know, an experienced and great emergency manager, they're probably as old as I am. And I only got a few more years left. 
And so we need to, you need to keep that constant flow of people in the system, just like you need doctors and nurses and policemen and everybody else. If we need a constant flow of emergency managers and we need to build their capacity. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll be happy if there are, is any time to take any questions uh, from myself or the rest of the panel, go right ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Harlan. Um, uh, there's a saying, you can't keep a good man down. So I'm sure you have many, many more years of, of sharing your experiences and doing good work where you are um, with USAID. So thank, thank you for that. Um, it made me think as well during your presentation of, you know, in terms of kind of the, finding the right candidates. Um, I mean, you mentioned about kind of, you know, candidates who may have PhDs or masters in the US, for example, looking to get into this kind of line of work. I think we, we recognize that there's probably two ends to that conversation. One is someone like me, my original background was I didn't have the, the, the kind of academic background, but I went out as a volunteer because I was enthusiastic, empathetic, um, and built up my knowledge that way. And on the other spectrum, you have someone maybe from an academic background who studied in university, but they don't necessarily have the experience on the ground and the kind of recognition that you need to be completely flexible and things don't go by the book in emergencies. And it's it's recognizing how we build the capacity of both those kind of sets of people and everything in between um, to make sure that we, we don't lose out, for example, so that we don't create positions in our organizations where, for example, here's this job in supply chain, but you need a minimum of this academic criteria because there might be people who've done loads of years of really good on the ground experience, but might not be considered and vice versa, not necessarily getting someone just because they have academic background, but also recognizing that it can be a very different world on the ground. Um, so I think for each of us in our areas, it's, it's getting that, that balance of, of the right people with the right skills. And as you say, also being able to upskill them um, and, and help them through, through different trainings um, is, is incredibly important. So, so thank you for that. Um, I just, I recognize now we've gone over in, in time for the moment, apologies for that. Let me just check first with um, Madiatri, if we're okay to just carry on for a couple of more minutes so we can have some questions. Yes, sure. Take your time, Jason. That, that's great. And I appreciate speakers um, and participants. You may need to move on to the next thing. So if you do need to go, just drop in the chat that you need to run uh, off to another meeting. Um, but I'll keep this open for another few minutes, um, if that's OK, because we have a few questions. Um, one, one good question we've had from, from the, uh, the, the listeners is kind of how best um, do we smooth relationships with, let's say, local authorities, local communities and the people at let's say distributions or national level authorities, if you come in during an international kind of emergency, you know, for example, the local laws in a country, um, if you're coming in as an international kind of humanitarian offering, to, um, what kind of, how do we get over maybe um, the local laws and the lack of knowledge? Uh, some communities might be suspicious of, of international assistance, for example. Um, I think that's quite a good question. I mean, from my perspective, I think that comes with this whole topic of capacity building and preparedness. It's, it's building those relationships in between um, emergencies with the people on the ground, with the community leaders, with the NDMAs um, and the local authorities. Um, you know, having the open and frank discussions of if we come and we want to work with you, this is who we are, this is what we can do, this is what we've done before. Will this fit in your own internal kind of um, rules and regulations and plans for your own uh, responses to disasters. From my, you know, I have always felt I'm always a guest when I go, if I go overseas to a country um, and I have to have the utmost respect for, for the existing rules and regulations and, and the cultures. Um, and just because I might think something works well doesn't mean I should think I can impose it um, onto the will of people who I think I'm, I'm, I'm uh, helping. Um, I feel we always need to keep an open mind that we can always learn new ways of, of working with people um, and respecting their kind of rules and regulations and, and that. I mean, does, does anyone else in the panel have any kind of experience of that in any of your operations or your work in terms of any tips and tricks of, of how to get across in, a, in an emergency um, that you're there to, to help, but recognize that you know, you're, you're a guest in that kind of environment? Um, 
I need to raise my hand, right? Um, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, we have a little bit of experience with that uh, from the past deployments that we've done. As I said, we have two programs, right? We have preparedness and we have response. Uh, well, we also have recovery, but that's to a lesser extent, and that is more left to the local, uh, uh, local initiatives. Uh, the reason why we have this in, in the Guard uh, program, while we have this, this mixture of um, participants, is just to make sure that these networking, these contacts are being established and laid for the future. Uh, I have a few, I see a few colleagues here from, from AHA, Deepo is there. Um, in, when, when, when we went to Balipapan to, to respond to the uh, Sulawesi uh, tsunami, um, it, wasn't, it, it, it wasn't easy in the beginning, but through a proper network and through a proper approach um, and following the rules, the quintessential thing is don't think that by you being a, a disaster responder, you're above the law. That is the first thing you need to avoid at all costs in every country. You are there to help, yes, but you still need to go through the process that has been established. And, um, and uh, AHA was very uh, instrumental in, in getting a few of my colleagues who flew in, uh, where there was a, a mismatch of information between immigration and us, but that was solved in, 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 in a minimal amount of time. So you need, and, and that is one of the, one of the key um, uh, advantages of having that guard workshop with that mixture of participants who have something to say in these things. We've got immigration, we've got police, we've got the CAA, we've got the, uh, uh, the airport management. Um, all, that, all that is quintessential to have, to make sure that, hey guys, you know, uh, help will come in, who do they contact? I, I spoke about that contact list that needs to go into the guard preparedness program, right? Or the assessment program, where we say these are the critical phone numbers, not names. Names change, people rotate, people go away, others come in. But these offices might not change at, 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 at that particular uh, same pace. So it needs a name of the office and it needs a phone number, an email, whatever there is, um, in, 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 that, in, in that assessment as well. And that is critical. It's two things. It's knowing who to talk to prior to you going there. And two, making sure that you have the right contacts on paper or personally. Thank you. And I, I, would add, I would add to that, you know, search, I learned from search and rescue people. You know, they will not rush into a building uh, unless they're sure it's safe. They will look and shore it, make sure it's shored up they could hear somebody in their trap screaming, but if they just rush into that building without that, without knowing what they're getting into, it could collapse and then all of them would be trapped in there. So the same thing for any organization going into a new country, a new situation. Don't, you know, do your homework. You know, <laughs> sometimes taking a day or two to, to do a little bit of research, you know, again, and have those contacts and, and whatever, find out what's going on before you go in is going to save you a lot of time and a lot of effort. Rushing in without doing that, you you don't know what you're getting into and could actually get in, you know, end up wasting a lot more time on the ground not being able to operate. So, you know, while speed is important, you know, know where you're going and why. Um, so, yeah, thank thank you, Harlan. And I think this is this is part of the beauty of, of the Helix Expo um, and the work that AHA does in the region as well is, is setting up these kind of events where the different stakeholders can come together, um, where the current thinking, um, where the training opportunities, where the collaboration can, can be shared. Um, and then any of us here can now share this in our own countries um, with either community leaders or with uh, NDMAs, for example, um, and other organizations and, and getting the message out of like, this is the current thinking. Um, and then those people can then kind of make their own networking um, um, decisions and contacts. To, so that, as you say, when an event happens, it's not so much of a shock to have big international um, organizations coming in, you're already made the networking and the contacts. Um, and as you say, that's crucially important to keep the speed going as well in the overall response 
for those beneficiaries. So, so thank you for that. Um, one question we had was, um, how is HELP collaborating with universities in Asia? Um, I think I mentioned that um, during my bit. Um, briefly, what we do is we create some, some uh, uh, memorandum of understandings with, with various uh, universities in the region. Because as I said, they, universities have a very specific specialization and, and Jonas mentioned it from an academic background and skills and things there that humanitarian agencies can learn from and that we all can learn from if we're involved in supply chains um, and bring those views um, together to, to the field. So what we do is we kind of can make those links between universities and humanitarian agencies. We can do joint research um, projects. Uh, we can do joint trainings. Um, we can look to support universities in having maybe um, conferences or workshops in their countries with their the students and the local NGOs who might be interested. And, and again, it's all about sharing those good practices and, and lessons learned to get that information out. So, so that's something we do. And you can find more on, on our website, help-logistics.org, on the kind of different things that, that we do there. Um, we also had a question um, which was aimed at Harlan. Um, which was talking about uh, education and mentorship. Um, so the comment is kind of that can be an expensive process. Um, and the question is, is government and tax money the most reliable way to do this? Or can NGOs set up a reliable process too? Um, so I think the, the way I read that kind of question is, you know, what, what could maybe NGOs do potentially to, to, to help create these kind of mentorship programs? Or do you feel that, it's the donor's responsibility to, to, to kind of lead on that? Or from your experience, are there ways that maybe NGOs and organizations can do their own um, kind of creation on that front? Well, I, I think at the, at the degree and education level, again, the investments that, that the US government made in our own you know, capability to train domestically, our own emergency managers for our own need, that's a model that needs to be looked at by other national governments. So the government of Indonesia, you know, could, could look at and pursue the same thing, the government of Vietnam and whatnot, working with their own academic institutions. Um, again, their, their development partners, dialogue partners might be able to help out as well. So to create, be able to create that ability to give local scholarships to people, get them out of high school and whatnot, get them into the uh, into the higher education field, learning emergency management and disaster management skills. Now, mentorship then comes once a person, you know, is, is hired into that function, hired into a, a, an organization or an office that's dealing with, or, you know, project with emergency management and whatnot. That's something the organization can do internally. And that's just, that's partly it's good management, partly it's just, making people available and, and, and letting people know that it is their job to pass on knowledge to everybody else. Um, within USAID, they, they've just kind of created a, a, a different kind of, a, yet an, an additional kind of mentoring program that's kind of just an as and when thing. And I mean, I signed up for that, um, you know, to be a mentor. And so I'm I'm somebody that if, if somebody within USAID wants to know or ask questions about, you know, what is our work or how do I how do I work in the humanitarian assistance part of USAID or what's it like or whatever, I'm one of the people they can contact and I'll, you know, I'll at least share my experience with them. And, you know, it's it's the lore and the stories and it's making time for that, but it's also, you know, making sure that the organization encourages that you know, and expects that of its senior and experienced staff, you know, it's not, they're not to hoard secret knowledge to protect their own jobs, you know, <laughs> they're supposed to grow and nurture the next generation beyond, beyond them, you know, it's talk about, we talk about sustainability, we have to have sustainability this way too, over. Yeah, very true, thank you for that, and it's good to get the, the donor perspective. Um, I've got another question here, um, and I might, might ask Jonas um, if you'd like to comment on this one. Um, there's a question which is, uh, what are the payoffs for centralization and decentralization of relief efforts? Um, I guess we could look at that as either in terms of stockpiling, perhaps, um, or in terms of even kind of um, the collaboration between um, you know, international organizations and NDMAs versus 
individual organizations going in and responding? I mean, do you see a kind of benefit to having both views, centralized and decentralized, um, across those kind of different um, perspectives? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think what our research has shown that um, what, I, what, I, what I mentioned before, that the, the potential of um, a more decentralized settings, at least in, in an emergency context, looks very promising if the capacity of the country is at a sufficient level. Um, um, however, and that's maybe a third, um, 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 because we have centralized, if that's global, then we have decentralized, if you consider as maybe in-country. I think the regional one is, is an extremely interesting one as well, and we just started looking more into this, and that I think fits very well into the uh, setup of that um, um, discussion and the, and the whole event. Um, um, I think, and that's what, what, what initial findings also show us that, I mean, you, you focus on the decentralized, but you have the regional that actually supports on top. So, and I think this is really something that um, 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 should probably look most into, that obviously you strengthen the country as much as you can, but let's look at prepositioning, for example. I mean, if you have preposition only in one country, let's say in the Philippines, and then you can't get it out easily to, to another country um, um, to support there, um, that's obviously at some point some waste if no, no, it's not really used. So I think if we have a, find a flexible system that actually um, um, either allows the countries to kind of like share either experts or commodities more efficiently, effectively with each other, um, obviously there's some, some work to be done here um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a bilateral level. Um, or if you have it even on a, on a regional level where you have already some kind of like union and, 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 and set up like, like, like ASEAN, I think it would be much more easy to set something up like this. And I think then um, the investment is even more, more worthwhile. Be prepositioning, be it actually in staff, be it in any kind what you're investing, if they can actually share resources with each other, I think that's for me the, 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 the maybe the state of the art solution um, if you can actually move in this direction. And I think that's again, that's where AHA is doing a tremendous job because they're moving in this direction. And you will see the benefits for sure, or you will see them already, obviously. Yeah. Great. No, thank, thank you, Jonas. That's, that's a very uh, good, good perspective. Um, so, in the interest of time, apologies if I didn't get to some of your questions, um, but I think we'll, we'll start to wrap it up now. Um, I'm going to hand back to Madiatri from AHA um, for any uh, closing kind of um, admin. I think there's a, there's a potential photo. Um, we've lost a few participants because I've run over in time. So apologies for that, uh, Madiatri. Um, but just from my side, I'd just like to thank all the speakers and the participants uh, for coming today um, and to thank AHA um, for putting together the, these sessions during this expo. Um, I think it's great and I'd encourage um, people to, to continue uh, looking at the different sessions um, over the next couple of days and reaching out to, to AHA um, for, for any further information around the expo. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll pass over to Madiatri to close us out. Thank you, Jason. Thank you to all speakers for the um, exciting sessions and sharing of your uh, thoughts and experience. And for all participants, I've shared a link for the feedback on the chat box. Uh, your feedback will be helpful for us uh, for the future events. And also, if you still have uh, questions, you can write on the exhibition. Go to the exhibitions and you can choose uh, any of the uh, exhibition uh, host organization that you would like to see and you can uh, write up questions and they will directly answer your questions. And before we close uh, this uh, focus session, I would like to invite you to turn on your video. So we will get um, a picture of us. Uh, I believe it's a part of our, our culture here. Take a picture if you don't mind. Um, let me see. If you are able to share your video screen, that will be great. And I need your very best of smile. I know it's already half past 5 p.m. Jakarta time. So. Uh, let me take your picture. So let me count in one, two, three. Let me count. Okay, one, two, three. Smile. And uh, sorry, let me count once more. One, two, three. Smile. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, for all participants. Thank you. Um, see you tomorrow. We still have a. Uh, uh, session for tomorrow. Thank you.